In October 1942, on a remote German island in the Baltic Sea, the first successful launch of a rocket into the stratosphere took place. Originally, all the scientists had wanted to do was go to the moon, but instead, they had created Hitler's most advanced weapon of terror. Hitler had the idea that uh, maybe the rocket could help him to win that war. In its last desperate attempt to turn the course of World War II, Nazi Germany unleashed an arsenal of sinister weapons against the Allies. In the next few months, more than 60,000 people would be killed or seriously wounded. One of their children came into us and said, Mummy hasn't come home. And actually, Mummy never did come home. Using rare archive film and color reenactments, Battle Stations enters the world of rocket scientists, secret weapons, and the race to seek and destroy two of Hitler's most elusive and devastating weapons of war. Germany's fascination with rockets and the idea of interplanetary travel dated back to the 1920s, when a wave of rocket fever swept through the country. The German army decided to involve itself in rocket research out of its desire to circumvent the harsh terms of the Treaty of Versailles, which Germany was forced to sign after its defeat in World War I. The treaty imposed severe limits on the armaments Germany could produce, but contained a loophole. It made no mention of rockets. To the German army, this meant that rockets, if developed in secrecy, would be a viable weapon. But building rockets was still predominantly done by civilian enthusiasts. Our idea was to carry mail from one place on Earth to another one. Particularly in Germany, we have a lot of small islands in the North Sea, and even in the Baltic Sea. And in bad weather, of course, you couldn't even send the mailman over there. He didn't want to get on a ship and uh, maybe get stranded. And of course, if you did it by ship, it took you a week to get your mail there. With the rocket, we had figured out already it would take about half an hour. So it was a big advantage. During this period, a brilliant young aristocrat named Werner von Braun became interested in rockets. He'd been obsessed with the idea of space travel ever since his mother had given him a small telescope as a child. Werner von Braun was actively developing his own rocket designs when he approached the German army for funding. They liked his practical ideas and enthusiasm and offered him a job. He was just 20 years old. In 1932, he began working at the Army Experimental Station under the direction of Colonel Walter Dornberger, the man responsible for Army rocket development. It was the start of a long association that would last for over 30 years. When Adolf Hitler came to power, he poured money into a massive expansion of the armed forces and granted additional funds for the army to build a new rocket research facility. The location chosen for the new site was Pinamunda, an isolated island on the western edge of the Baltic Sea. In 1936, construction crews began turning the forested island into the most modern research center in the world. Pinamunda was an ideal location for a secret rocket base. Heavily forested, it could hide workshops, power plants, and test stands. The whole facility was self-sufficient. My first impression in Pinamunda was that it was a huge enterprise. The area was great on the island. There was a little railroad connecting the different points. There were big hangars, big halls, big laboratories, manufacturing halls, test stands. It was a very great impression. 
Within three years, Pinamunda expanded to include shops and living quarters for the community of 4,000 skilled workers living within its perimeter. A railway brought in another 11,000 employees who lived in nearby towns. The security was very tight, and you normally had to stop at the gate and show your pass. And even the people who came with the railroad, they were normally even checked twice. They were checked once when they got on the railroad, and they were checked again when they finally entered the main area of the facility. The people working at Pinamunda developed a real sense of community. Its sea and long sandy beaches were ideal for recreation. For 20-year-old mathematician Ruth Kraft, it was a perfect place to work. It was a very attractive location on the Baltic Sea. This was a dream holiday destination for people from middle Germany like myself, back in the 30s. I soon sensed that the facility was consciously designed as a kind of ghetto for scientists. The German Army's first two experimental rockets, designated the A1 and A2, were very small and basic. But the A3, which was 20 feet in length, was a practical research device. Its purpose was to improve the steering by the use of gyroscopes and to develop the thrust of the motor which would propel the missile through the sound barrier. In 1937, encouraged by the success of the A3, the German High Command issued specifications for a new rocket. The missile should have a 200-mile range, a one-ton warhead, and be transportable by railway. Von Braun came up with the A4 design. But before the A4 combat rocket could become a reality, another test model was developed, the A5. On this new model, fins were added to improve stability. Test launches over the Baltic Sea were encouraging. Fenner von Braun, seen here helping to recover a rocket, was to use the A5 as the standard test model until the A4 could be completed. But on the outbreak of war in September 1939, Hitler reduced funding for long-term rocket research. Hitler had initially not assigned high priority to rocket work. He figured that maybe in a way he was right. He figured that it would take longer. Then, in his opinion, the war would uh, last. Hitler had been present at one of the early rocket tests and was not impressed. Most people who saw a rocket firing with a lot of noise and a big flame coming out of your rocket engine were really quite impressed. But Hitler just shook his head, turned around and walked away without saying anything. And of course, Stormberger and von Braun were quite disappointed. But Werner von Braun had faith in what was happening at Pinamunda. Given more time, a bigger and more powerful missile would be within his grasp. He feared, however, that time was running out. And without Hitler's support, long-range rocket development in Germany would come to an end. The development of secret weapons at Pinamunda had once again become a priority for Adolf Hitler. Two years of war had stretched his forces to the limit. By late 1941, Hitler ordered Werner von Braun, Germany's top rocket scientist, to go ahead with production of the A4 the world's first long-range combat rocket. Although Werner von Braun was the technical director of the A4 project, the logistics for its production fell to Walter Dornberger, Pinemunda's military chief. The friendship and common aim of the two men would prove vital to the project. Along with Dornberger, von Braun had assembled a team of brilliant scientists and engineers to produce the A4 rocket. Augusta Frieda was von Braun's secretary in those early years. Dr. von Braun was very 
Dr. von Braun was very relaxed, never strict or the way one imagines a boss to be. In the evenings, we would write down all the results of the tests. We were enthusiastic about the idea and how to put it into effect. We never really thought of it as a weapon. It was always a research project. Werner von Braun worked tirelessly on the many technical problems of his design. Dr. von Braun was obsessed with his idea. Otherwise, he would not have been able to inspire his colleagues the way he did, and they wouldn't have been so devoted to him. He also drew the right people closer to him, and they really worked hard to continue his line of thought. It was always most impressive to, to listen to him. He, he was an excellent speaker. He could formulate his ideas very beautifully and convincingly. Von Braun was extremely patient to tell and explain his standpoint and to listen to the other one and to bring forth his arguments, not with, with uh, overwhelming power or with authority or so, but just with technical reason and logic. The A4 would travel at roughly four times the speed of sound, a velocity unheard of at the time. The aerodynamics of the weapon were a critical factor in the early stages. We had a big wind tunnel at Pingemunde, and uh, we had wind tunnel measurements at uh, various Mach numbers from subsonic to Mach 5, roughly. We were trying to build a supersonic airplane. And that's not that easy. That was when I understood what it means to design and develop a projectile that can go beyond the Mach number, that is, supersonic speed. I realized something special was going on there, or something special was being developed. This early filmed diagram shows the technical achievements of the A4. The rocket is driven by the reaction of a jet of high-speed gases produced from the combustion of nine tons of liquid oxygen and alcohol in the space of 60 seconds. The man responsible for this revolutionary breakthrough in the rocket motor was Dr. Walter Thiel. Walter Thiel was in a way parallel to von Braun. He was reporting to von Braun, so von Braun was definitely the overall boss. But Thiel had pretty much his own field. He was not really a designer. He was, in fact, a chemical engineer himself. But he was in charge of the development of the rocket engine. The capacity of one fuel tank was four and a half tons of liquid oxygen. Keeping the fuel tanks empty until the launch made the A4 easier to transport. Located above the fuel tanks were two gyroscopes which controlled the rocket. These operated the large graphite vanes placed behind the jet to deflect the exhaust gases and so steer the rocket. The first assembled A4 was finally ready for testing by March 1942. was a spectacular failure. When another test failed, the A4 critics in Berlin wanted the project cancelled. It was costing billions of marks with nothing to show for it. Von Braun was worried. When the tests failed, he came into his office. Although he was very angry, he kept it to himself. It was terrible for him because each time it was a setback and he couldn't make any progress. The second launch failed at about that point. So again, many people said, we told you so, you just can't make it. And then fortunately with the third one, which was really the last one which had been permitted by Hitler, Hitler wanted to cancel the whole operation. And he insisted, you at least have to show us in one good launch that you can make it, that you can obtain a reasonable uh, distance with your missile. On October the 23rd, 1942, an improved A4 was fired.
Once the 25-ton engine thrust kicked in, the rocket accelerated skyward, breaking through the sound barrier in 40 seconds. Von Braun had made his first major breakthrough. After a very successful launch in a big party we had, everyone was drunk. This is the first time that the human-built article has used a part of outer space to get from one place on Earth to another place on Earth. And so that's, for me, really the beginning of the space age. But the work at Pinamunda was far from over. Another secret weapon was now being developed that would be the prototype of the modern cruise missile. While rocket scientist Werner von Braun was developing the world's first space rocket at Pinamunda for the German army, the Luftwaffe was planning its own secret weapon. By spring 1942, the war was going badly for the Luftwaffe. Having failed to win the Battle of Britain, its commander-in-chief, Hermann Goering, had lost credibility with Hitler. The second in command of the Luftwaffe was Erhard Milch, a ruthless and ambitious man who, before the war, had built Lufthansa, Germany's national airline, into one of the world's finest. Hitler liked Milch. The fact that he had a Jewish father did not matter. Milch was determined to restore the Luftwaffe in Hitler's eyes and proposed a new weapon, a flying bomb. Milch maintained that unmanned flying bombs offered numerous advantages over conventional bombing. They were cost-effective, had large payloads, and there was no risk to air crew. Unlike the rocket, which was taking years to develop, the Luftwaffe wanted a quick solution and decided to adopt the pulse jet engine for its flying bomb, now designated the FI-103. The early designs showed that the pulse jet was in fact a primitive jet engine that worked on the principle of forcing air through a narrow tube. The FI-103 was launched by placing it on a sled mounted on steel rails on top of a long ramp similar to a ski ramp. A rocket booster then catapulted the flying bomb several hundred miles per hour in a matter of seconds. The Luftwaffe tested the FI-103 at Pinamunda, although this was kept totally separate from the Army's rocket tests. The first flying bomb only flew for 60 seconds and subsequent launches failed miserably. But Hitler saw enough potential in the weapon to let development continue. The FI-103 was in fact the prototype of the modern cruise missile. Some new photos here, sir. The activities on Pinamunda also began to attract the attention of the Allies, especially British intelligence. The British knew the Germans had been working on secret weapons even before the war but never knew the type of weapons they were. But by 1943, enough intelligence had been gathered for Prime Minister Winston Churchill to take the threat seriously. He established a committee codenamed Crossbow to review all the evidence of German long-range weapons. Top secret reports compiled by British intelligence were taken by special courier to the cabinet war rooms, deep underground in London, where the Crossbow Committee met. The committee was headed by Duncan Sands, a politician, and Churchill's son-in-law. The other leading figure was Lord Churwell, the British government's scientific advisor who strongly argued that the Germans were not capable of building a rocket which would pose a threat to the country. In simple terms, Churwell believed the solid fuel rocket would be too large to be a practical proposition and that any alternative, particularly the use of liquid fuel, was beyond the technology of the time. Sands did not agree. Cherwell insisted that talk of a rocket was a hoax to conceal some other weapon, possibly a flying bomb. Sands, always the shrewd politician, 
believe the Germans probably had both a rocket and flying bomb and immediately ordered an increase in aerial reconnaissance missions. A great deal of the evidence for the German long-range weapons had so far been obtained by photographic reconnaissance. Looking for secret weapons was a new field for the photographic interpreters, who had been trained to look for conventional military hardware and movement. You always checked in case there was something there that wasn't there before. And that's when you found, oh, there's a new road there, or there's a new, there's a new building there. What's that? So you get out the old cover and look that up. No building. So what are they putting up there? It just worked from checking over and over again. The breakthrough came when interpreters found a small pilotless aircraft sitting on the end of a firing ramp at Pinamunda a possible flying bomb. Then, on June the 23rd, 1943, another sortie produced a photograph where a rocket could clearly be seen. The British were stunned. It was now obvious the Germans were planning a rocket attack on Britain. Duncan Sands immediately requested a massive bombing raid on Pinamunda. On the night of August the 17th, 1943, the Royal Air Force amassed 500 heavy bombers to attack Pinamunda. Their mission was not simply to destroy the base, but to kill the scientists and key people whose work threatened England. The raid was launched in complete secrecy. The true nature of the target was not revealed even to the RAF bomber crews. The inhabitants of Pinamunda were used to hearing enemy bombers fly over on their way to bomb Berlin. We did not take any notice of the sirens wailing. We did not even get out of bed for that, because we were used to reconnaissance planes in the air, but we always thought they would not see us. High explosive and incendiary bombs began falling. Pinamunda was caught unprepared and soon became a sea of flames. And that particular night, I, I remember that very well. We went in into the ditches and lay down, and the bombs came. There were a number of hits by bombs in buildings, and fires began to burn. It was a, a very, very ghastly situation. Due to the phosphorus and the air pressure from the bombs, everything, including the debris, the sand, pine needles, were flying around. And then we saw all the bodies lying there, torn to pieces. A total of 735 people were killed including many scientists, among them the man responsible for the A4 motor, Dr. Thiel. Thiel's family, his entire family, was completely wiped out. And there were, of course, a number of other key people, but Thiel was probably the most important man. And in that sense, probably the air raid uh, obtained its objective to kill the German workers so that the work could not continue in Peenemünde. The raid had severely damaged Pinamunda and set the A4 project back by several critical months. It also prompted the Germans to shift some of their experimental activities to an SS artillery range near the village of Blitzna in Poland, beyond the range of Allied bombers. Despite the setback to the A4 rocket, Hitler's other terror weapon, the deadly flying bomb, was at last ready to be unleashed against the Allies. Although the devastating RAF raid on the German base at Pinamunda was a serious setback to German rocket development, it had not affected Hitler's new flying bomb. By 1944, these terror weapons were now being secretly transported to their launch sites. A series of aerial reconnaissance missions by the Allies along the French and Belgian coast 
had identified a number of possible launch sites for long-range weapons against Britain. Gradually, one was able to build up that there was something going on. So then we managed to plot the whole of that coastline. There must have been over 100 sites, and alarm bells rang because it was much bigger than anybody expected. And all the sites were pointing to London. On June the 13th, 1944, exactly one week after the Allied invasion of Europe had begun, the first German flying bomb was launched across the English Channel. It landed in the east end of London, where it killed six people. Nazi propaganda minister, Josef Goebbels, announced to the world that Wergel Tungswaffe 1, Vengeance Weapon 1, had been used in retaliation for the Allied invasion of Normandy. The weapon was now known as the V-1. Over 3,000 V-1s would be launched against London in the next few weeks. The British knew little about the V-1. The blind, impersonal nature of the flying bombs made people on the ground feel helpless. There was no human enemy to shoot down. We did know they were coming because they made a very distinctive sound and it was a sort of room, 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 and then suddenly it would stop and you just dive for cover wherever you were. There was this terrible silence. It just seemed like the whole world stopped. The V-1s were launched day and night, the one-ton warhead of high explosives causing enormous damage in built-up areas. Cyril de Man was a chief fire officer at the time. I was on many a job within minutes before the smoke had gone down. It was horrific, really, and you'd have uh, people, uh, members of the family, or possibly neighbours and people they knew, seeing dismembered bodies laying all over the street, and there were scenes of, uh, uh, of terrible distress. I saw so much of it that um, I hardened myself. I, you know, I, I couldn't afford to uh, be emotional about it, otherwise I wouldn't have been doing my job. Nobody escaped the effects of the indiscriminate bombing, although London schoolboys like Tony Moss felt it was an adventure. I suppose I didn't fully sense the danger, being only about 13 years of age. We got used to them. We even used to go out into the garden and watch these noisy things go over. They sounded like a motorcycle going across the sky. And uh, eventually, of course, they became known as flying bombs and then buzz bombs, and then people nicknamed them the doodle bug. The British authorities were stunned by the magnitude of the bombardment. It had been difficult to plan how best to defend London against the V-1 without knowing the precise nature of the weapon. The main defences were based on dealing with conventional bombers. Huge gas-filled barrage balloons were erected. Their thick cables were designed to rip the wings off any flying machine that flew into them. They eventually accounted for 232 flying bombs. The anti-aircraft guns found it difficult to stop the smaller, low-flying V-1s. The British soon realized the best way to combat the V-1 was to concentrate their guns and destroy the flying bombs long before they reached London. Two new American defense weapons were also introduced, a radar system which plotted the course of the flying bombs, giving the gun crews more accuracy, and a new close proximity fuse in the gun shells, which exploded when it was within range of the target, turning a near miss into a hit. strategy worked. 
and V1s were being shot out of the sky at an increasing rate. The Royal Air Force also had considerable success shooting down V1s. They deployed specially adapted Spitfires and the Hawker Tempest, their fastest fighter. However, because of its speed and size, the V1 was a difficult target. If you saw a flying bomb coming towards you, there's no good saying, oh, I'll get in behind it and shoot it down, because, in fact, you would never have caught it in that way. We had to have an entirely different technique of getting up above them, uh, then diving and with an aileron turn so that we dive, dive virtually on top of them and then f flattened out behind them, and then you're in a position to, to shoot it down. If you got directly behind it, you had the heat haze from the jet, and all you could see was a couple of wingtips. But you'd pull up, pull into about four or 500 yards and give it a burst. If an aircraft ran out of ammunition, some pilots adopted the highly dangerous tactic of tipping the wings of the V-1 to send it off course. I put my port wing underneath the starboard wing of the flying bomb, and I'm afraid that that didn't work. It just skidded away from me. And I thought, well, this is no good, so a change of technique. Uh, the next time I put my wing under and then immediately flicked my stick over and the thing just catapulted into the ground, into a wood just outside Seven Oaks. By the end of August, only one bomb in seven got through to the London area. It looked as if the V-1 had been mastered. Of the 8,000 V-1s that were launched against London, 2,400 reached their target. The price of Hitler's terror weapon was high. A total of 24,000 civilians were killed or seriously injured. Three quarters of a million houses were damaged. Although the V-1 campaign had failed, a second threat to England now drew near. A silent, deadly missile was about to be hurled at London. By 1944, German rocket scientist Werner von Braun and his team had made great strides in rocket technology since their first successful launch of the A-4 two years earlier. Yet problems with the A-4's propulsion system meant von Braun was still unable to give Hitler a fully operational combat rocket. In July, the A-4 project came under the control of Heinrich Himmler, head of the notorious SS and the second most powerful Nazi in Germany. Von Braun had repeatedly told Himmler the A-4 was not ready to use, but Himmler had convinced Hitler that the scientists were being far too cautious in firing Germany's new secret weapon. It was not yet fully reliable, and it, it was always a particular effort on von Braun's part to convince Himmler particularly that our rocket is not yet accurate enough and not yet reliable enough to be used as a real, good and successful weapon. When Hitler finally decided to really use it as a weapon and to eventually call it the V2, it was not completely developed. So we should have had an extra two or three years to do final developments, and then the V2 would have been able to have really a very accurate, a pinpoint uh, a missile, which can pick out a building uh, in a, a city complex or ship at sea. After the RAF had bombed the original rocket testing site at Pinamunda in August 1943, tests of the A4 were also being carried out at an artillery range at Blizna in Poland. The Polish resistance had been keeping a vigilant watch on the activities at Blizna, when during a test flight, an A-4 fell from the sky, landing on the banks of the river Bug without exploding. 
The Poles found the rocket, and before the German recovery team arrived, managed to hide it by rolling it into the water. The Germans, unable to locate the A4, gave up the search. Working under constant threat of discovery, Polish engineers supervised the dismantling of the missile before contacting British intelligence. The British desperately needed technical information about the mysterious A4. And on July the 25th, an RAF Dakota landed on a little used airfield in Poland to collect the components of the stolen rocket and take them back to London. This vital new evidence confirmed the destructive potential of the Nazis' long-range rocket. Churchill was deeply worried. With the V1 campaign still raging over London, he decided to keep news of the new deadly weapon from the general public. With luck, the launch sites could be hunted down and destroyed before they could be used. With the collapse of the German forces in France, the Allies would soon reach the borders of the Reich itself. Hitler hoped to counter this threat by unleashing his new secret weapon, and on August the 29th, he ordered the A4 offensive to begin. The German army moved its A4 launch crews to The Hague in Holland, which was 200 miles from London, just within the missile's range. The Germans figured the Allies would be reluctant to bomb the Dutch capital, known as the City of Peace. The mobile launchers were hidden in the surrounding woods and then driven out into the open for firing. On September the 8th, 1944, the first A4 was launched against London. It reached a height of about 50 miles before falling at 3,000 miles per hour on its target. The whole flight took no more than five minutes. There was no warning. It came over and came down faster than the speed of sound, so that you heard the explosion from the bomb and then heard it come in a second or two afterwards. And it used to sound rather like a tube train coming into a station. The Nazi propaganda machine quickly dubbed the A4 the V2, Vengeance Weapon 2. What made the V2 unique among the weapons of World War II was the fact that it could not be intercepted. There was no defense against the rocket once it was in the air. Sixty days after the offensive began, the local Woolworths in Deptford, East London, was crowded with shoppers, mostly women and children, when a V2 hit the store. My school actually was more or less on the corner opposite where the, the bomb had gone off. But it was a, a very devastating thing. We knew lots of the, of the women that were in the shop. They were neighbors. And uh, I can remember one, one of, the, of their children came into us and said, Mummy hasn't come home. And actually, Mummy never did come home. We didn't know at the time, but it turned out to have been the biggest V2 disaster in Britain. The shoppers never had a chance. 240 of them were killed or seriously injured. In all, 1,100 V2 struck England, causing over 9,000 casualties. Destruction of property was massive. In London alone, half a million houses were destroyed. As the final months of the war drew to a close, the Germans, who had stockpiled thousands of both the deadly V1s and V2s, continued launching their V weapons. When the launch sites in France and Belgium were overrun by the Allied armies, the Luftwaffe began using bombers to launch V1s. Over 1,000 were fired in this way. Hitler also launched a V-weapon campaign of terror against the Belgian city of Antwerp in a desperate bid to stop its port being used by the Allies. 9,000 V-1s 
and 1,600 V2s were fired on the city, causing 10,000 casualties. But time had run out for Hitler. The Allied forces were already advancing into the heart of the Third Reich. Yet both the V1 and V2 continued to be launched until six weeks before the war's end, on May the 8th, 1945. Although the V weapons did not win the war for Hitler, they did have an immense effect on Allied resources. They forced the Allies to divert thousands of aircraft, 2,700 guns, and a quarter of a million troops from frontline duties. After the war, conflicting opinions rose as to how effective the V weapons had been to the German war effort. General Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander, remarked that if Hitler had succeeded in using the V weapons against English ports instead of London, the invasion of Normandy might have been written off. On the other hand, Albert Speer, the German Minister of Supply, thought the V2 had done the Germans more harm than the Allies, as the quantity of highly skilled men and scarce raw materials could have produced a large number of jet fighters which would have been decisive in the air war. With the war's end, there was a frantic race between the victors to capture as much information on the V weapons as they could. The Americans took the V-1, renaming it the JB-2, which they planned to launch against Japan. 100 V-2s and tons of spare parts were also seized and transported back to the United States. But the victors also wanted the scientists. Werner von Braun made a conscious decision to offer his services to the Americans. And on May the 2nd, he surrendered to the American army. Von Braun and his team of 118 German scientists and engineers went to work for the Americans at the White Sands Proving Grounds in New Mexico, developing guided missiles. Due to their new allegiance, it was considered unwise for them to take pride in the A-4 weapon system, which had been used as a means of terror against Allied civilians. In America, Werner von Braun's leadership qualities again shone through, and he was able to return to his original dream of putting men on the moon. He was a genius as an engineer, as an organizer, as a project planner, as a leader, as a person who could convince others of uh, his ideas. I think with Werner von Braun, we would not have uh, uh, the space form that we ha have today. We certainly would not have been on the moon, and uh, we probably would not have an international space station going around the Earth today. Werner von Braun had begun his career with the top secret rocket, but his dream was realized when in 1969, the Apollo spacecraft landed men on the moon. It was just 27 years after the first successful launch of the A-4 at Pinamunda. Um, in 1943, I was on the staff of the Chief Regional Fire Officer for London at um, Lambeth, Lambeth headquarters. And the Chief Regional Fire Officer, Mr. Frederick Delve, 
late Sir Frederick, um, began by saying, you've been reading this story about Hitler's latest secret weapon, because he had secret weapons pretty well all through the war. And he said, well, it's no joke. The papers tended to make it a bit of a joke. Uh, he said, um, we know, in fact, that it's um, a pilotless aircraft which has got a 10-tonne warhead and um, uh, it's directed and it's expected to be aimed at London in large numbers. Uh, the first one I saw was in Ilford because I was stationed in Ilford and it came across the sky <coughs> in the early hours of the morning. Uh, there was the blackout, of course, which was very intense and the first thing we saw was a glow, uh, a red, reddish glow, quite like, like a fireball, coming towards us, and there was a terrific noise, like, uh, I can only liken it to half a dozen motorbikes without exhausts running at top speed, to give you an idea of what it was like. It was a tremendous racket, and it came roaring towards us, flying moderately high, they normally fly at about um, between three and 4,000 feet. And this one would be about that, I guess. And um, I thought, first of all, wasn't used to these, um, f f the flying bombs, I thought it was an aircraft, German aircraft, which had been set on fire by the RAF <clears throat> when it was about to crash. But um, this, this, this row, I thought, was something to do with its condition. And then all of a sudden, there was a sudden halt. The noise stopped like that. And then <clears throat> we're just watching the thing. And uh, the flame went out. And I couldn't see what happened after that because it was in the dark. The next 10 seconds, I suppose, afterwards, a tremendous explosion, fire going up, and a, a tremendous roar. It wasn't so very far off. It had crashed in Ilford, and um, so of course we went on there, and we thought it was a crashed aircraft at the time. Um, no fires were started, but a tremendous amount of uh, blast damage had been done. Lots of people buried in the uh, debris of their homes, and we just piled in and got to work and uh, pulled them out and um, sent them off. The civil defence people were there, the ambulances, Women's Voluntary Service and all the ancillary people came around. And um, there was, as I said, 30, 73 fell on London on that first, on that second night. And after that, they came at about the same uh, number, in the same numbers. We used to be able to get home uh, round about breakfast time and get the troops home, give them a meal and put them to bed and uh, because we knew we were going to get a repeat programme the following night, and so they were able to get a good, night, a good night's rest in during the day. And um, that, was, I, I, you know, we, 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 that was able to sustain us. But when the, the uh, V weapons came along, 24 hours a day, we never knew. Sometimes there'd be one, sometimes two or three or four, in the sky at the same time and we were continually on the run and uh, the damage, the blast was much greater from each single uh, flying bomb or rocket than it was from a, a thousand pound bomb. Uh, there was more um, physical damage from the blast of a V1 and a V2. The V2 was the rocket and um, in the case of the um, one of them I went to at Hughes Mansions, there was a block of three flats, each of 50 flats, side by side. And this uh, rocket, at about 7.30 in the morning, buried itself in, in the foundations of the centre block and reduced that block to rubble and severely damaged the block on either side. Uh, so that was um, a degree of the damage from a rocket. 
It dived into the ground. Remember, it went 70 feet into the stratosphere, came over and came down faster than the speed of sound. So that you heard the explosion from the bomb and then heard it come in a second or two afterwards. And it used to sound rather like a tube train coming into a station. <sighs> you know, that noise that you hear. That struck me as that was what it was like. Anyway, a, um, the, the um, uh, flying bombs and the rockets did much about the same, individually, same damage. Although the um, flying bomb, because it exploded on impact and on the surface, had a wider effect of brass, the rockets did more serious damage closer in. But both of them were very... Uh, I would say that they were all uh, serious explosions from the V-bombs, uh, more serious than that we'd had during the Blitz. Was um, at about 7.31 morning at Dagenham. Uh, I was um, serving in that particular area and I got news of this flying bomb having come down. It was on there about 10 minutes, I suppose, after it had, had arrived. <coughs> and I pulled up in my car and uh, got out. It was my normal practice to pull up on the outside and I'd go into the centre of the damage. And I saw a man running towards me. And um, presumably he was the father and he was carrying a child that he was clutching tightly to his breast. And as he ran, I realised that he was bereft. He just overcome with emotion. And I take it that this was his child. And he clutched this baby, two years old, I guess. And as he ran, I was conscious of two little fat legs jogging up and down as he ran. And as he got close to me, he was moaning. I got two little girls at home myself. And I, I, the sight and the sound haunted me for weeks after that. And um, at other incidents, you see, we were on the scene because of our uh, <coughs> good fortune in having towers in each fire station yard. We were able to set up special observation posts for the uh, V weapon explosions. We put a, a cover over the top to give people a bit of protection, mounted a table, which was a compass card, and over the top they got a telescope and a, a, a finger pointing down so that they would see an explosion over there and they would look through and look down and they would, they'd get a compass reading, 248 or whatever. And they pick up the telephone down to the control room where they had an enlarged map of this sort, exactly the same in line with this. And they would say, um, explosion 248 from this OP, OP number seven or whatever. And uh, they would have the compass card with a piece of elastic from the centre. And they would take the elastic with a drawing pin on the end and stretch it out over that reading, 248, and stick it in the side. So you've got a line from this OP across 248. And within seconds, they would have a report from another fire station somewhere over here. And they would give a different reading. And they would do the same there. And where the lines of elastic crossed, that would be it. And it was so accurate and so swift and so simple that we could tell within a minute, uh, not only the street, we could almost tell you the number of the house. It was so accurate. And so the result was that the crews were all standing by, the alert had been sounded, and the initial attendance was five pumps. That's 25 men and, and 25 men, and they would, uh, their main job, of course, was firefighting. But if there's no firefighting, they immediately go in and do rescue work. And um, if the officer in charge wanted some help, he would just say, make pumps 10, 15, 20, whatever. And um, they would um, make the number of pumps at that incident up to that particular number. 
So um, that's how we used to get on. Well, we would be on there very quickly, and I was on many a job within minutes before the smoke had gone down. And um, it was horrific, really. Um, very often you'd have, uh, it'd catch a lot of people in the street and their bodies would be lying all over the place. And you'd have uh, people, uh, members of the family, or possibly neighbours and people they knew, seeing dismembered bodies laying all over the street. And there were scenes of, uh, uh, of terrible distress, especially if it was um, members of a family, you know. Uh, we saw so much of it, I saw so much of it, that um, I hardened myself. I, you know, I, I couldn't afford to uh, be emotional about it, otherwise I wouldn't have been doing my job, wouldn't be thinking about other things and not what I should be doing. So we used to accept things that normally I would find um, very emotional, but always, I suppose it's the fact that um, I'd got two little girls at home, but whenever I saw infants and uh, toddlers pull out the dismembered bodies, you know, smashed about, and I very often found myself crying. Just couldn't help it. Not ashamed of it. It just happened. I, di I, I, I didn't worry about adults when they were pulled out. It didn't affect me the same. But children was the same. And uh, you would see this terrible distress about people who've just seen the shattered bodies of their members of their families laying there and being pulled out and perhaps maybe helping to pull them out themselves. And it was, um, it was very trying. That's why I say, what were the long hours, the lack of sleep and the, um, the, the general atmosphere of these things that, that it made this the most stressful period of the war for me. Some of them landed in the port. Many landed in the city. Life in Antwerp was transformed. Each bomb killed or wounded an average of 38 people. Old women accustomed to a round of housekeeping and shopping were suddenly crushed under tons of debris. The lives of children playing in the streets were violently interrupted. Homes became a ghostly setting for those who escaped death. Antwerp, its port and its people would have been wiped off the earth were it not for the defense system known as Antwerp X. The story of Antwerp X began before the bombs came. Allied intelligence knew that the Germans had been building launching sites east and southeast of Antwerp. Counter preparations had been made. Under General Claire Armstrong, a combined organization of American, British and Polish gunners were assigned to the defense of the city. It was their job to defend the city against the V-1. Against the V-2, which traveled too fast to be seen, there was no defense. We knew that the German attack could come from many directions. Our strategy was one of shifting defenses. When the V1s began to come over from one direction, batteries would be shifted quickly so that several belts of anti-aircraft fire, one behind the other, could protect the city. To make this strategy a success, new lines of attack had to be expected and anti-aircraft units had to move quickly from one position to another. The gun crews around Antwerp learned to meet the extraordinary demands made by their jobs. A move order was just a couple of points on a map, but to the men it meant something more, something vital and urgent. They had seen the damage and death that the V1s could bring. They knew that lives in Antwerp were at stake they learned the importance of moving quickly. 
At all hours of the day and night, the small towns of Belgium shuddered as heavy equipment rushed along the quiet streets on the way to new positions of defense. The men got to know their jobs so thoroughly that handling the guns became second nature to them. It was like walking or talking. It seemed they had done it always. They learned speed in setting up. Speed in getting the word through. Speed in firing. They learned accuracy. When the bombs first came, our gunners shot down only one out of every two bombs. Before the shooting was over, they were bringing down better than nine out of ten. It wasn't the gunners alone. At each step in the process of bringing down a bomb, there were men whose place in Antwerp X was vital. Observers moved far forward into frontline positions to spot the V1 soon after the takeoff from Germany. From these forward outposts, they flashed the earliest warning of an approaching bomb. Back at the battery, the signal comes in. And the gunners go to work. In a matter of seconds, each man is at his post, doing the job upon which all Antwerp was depending. A job of cooperation. A team of American and British troops blending its efforts. Through rapid estimations, the course of the bomb was plotted. Plotting was based on information received by radar units. Antennas scan the skies, listening, feeling, searching to discover the course of the bomb as exactly as possible. The bomb comes into range of the gun battery. And now the gun crews have their target. When one belt of guns failed to bring down a V1, there was at least one other battery backing up the first. Sometimes four and five belts of guns guarded the bomb lanes to Antwerp. For 160 days, the men of Antwerp X were on duty every day. 